And now, another exciting episode in the adventures of Outdoor Journal Radio. Well, hello there. Thank you for joining us. Outdoor Journal Radio, the podcast. I'm Angelo Biola. Flying solo, my co-pilot is off vacationing, reaping. Oh, my. That's right, folks. He's reaping the benefits of all his hard work. Vacationing. Who the hell gets vacations in the middle of the busiest time of year? Um, I don't know. We'll have to figure out. Uh, filling in sort of uh, along with me, our producer, Dean Taylor. Come on now. Give me a hell yeah. Yeah, baby. Uh, along with Volvo behind the camera, as per usual. And Nick, when he comes in, in and out, he just kind of flirts around. Flirts Come on around. now. Yeah. A wonderful program. Um, we we really wanted to get this one off the ground early, uh, early meaning in this uh, particular week, because this just hit the uh, the airwaves recently. And uh, later on today, we're going to be joined by a gentleman that you probably didn't know of until the last week or so when you started reading his name in the uh, articles that have been appearing throughout social media regarding the Miramichi and its striped bass and the new DFO allocations for that fishery. And the whole world is going to come tumbling down. The sky is falling. My God, what's going to happen to all of us? Well, we're going to discuss this with him. Uh, he is Professor uh, Trevor Avery. Dr. Avery will be joining us from uh, Acadia University. And uh, his opinion is that uh, what just took place this week is going to be the beginning of the end of that wonderful fishery in that species called striped bass. We will get to that in just a moment. Uh, Dean, what do you think of that, by the way? Just off the topic, just what do you think of that whole hubbub? Do you think it's just the overplayed a little bit, overkill? I don't know. It's hard to tell with like news articles that you see because the headlines are always trying to like they're trying to get attention, right? Right. So it'll be interesting to hear from him, you know, what he actually thinks about the whole thing. Well, wow, he's science, right? I yeah. mean, he's just numbers. I, I think you always have to err on the side of science. I don't care what anybody says. If you have a tough decision to make, one is based on science and one is based on gut. You got to go with the science. Mm-hmm. I think, but a lot of this, like the science that they have, I'm sure comes from people like us who are just out there, right? Like they're well, not out there every day, and the anglers are. So yeah, we'll talk about it. What happened in a moment? Let me just uh, get through um, this part of the show where I remind all the good people out there that we do have things other than a podcast. Uh, one of them is a television show that airs on Global Television Network, and also airs everywhere else in the world, uh, Sportsman's Channel. By the way, Dean, I saw for the very first time, I was watching the Sportsman's Channel late the other night, and look who popped up. It was us. I was thrilled to die. I'd never seen it on Sportsman Channel. Oh, really? I know we play there like four times a week, but I'd never seen it. I think Pete watches it there every week. Does he? Yeah. That's cool. Uh, anyways, uh, Sportsman's Channel, of course, uh, for you folks south of the border, WFN, the World Fishing Network. Come on now. Uh, is home for the Fish in Canada show and has been going. This is our 38th season. Give me a watching. hell yeah. Two more to go and I'm out of here. That's my contract and then that's it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I think I'm going to be a fishing guide. That'd be a good career. Hey, yeah, a fishing I like guide. That. I think that'd be a great... I think to, you'd be good at that. I think I'd be wonderful as a fishing guide. But, I, but I'd be one of those fishing guides where I got everything set up. I might even hire like an assistant fishing guide to work with me. Yeah. Right? And he'd do all like the dirty stuff. And I just want to sit in the back and I want to sort of orchestrate things. And, and like meet. A, I also want to meet people. Like I, a captain. I, I want to be the captain. Yeah. That's it. That's a good career. And, and, and mingle with people. Have fun with people. Maybe, you know, uh, uh, participate in the apre fishing activities mm. after uh, we get off the lake and stuff. That sounds nice. I think it'd be great. Yeah. If, you, if you think that'd be a good idea, let me know because I'll uh, put it out there for people to book me. Uh, but now that I'm here, I have to do what earns me money. And that is let you know that the Fishing Canada store is up and running and doing well. We've got all kinds of new products in there, midsummer products, uh, although you'd never know it by the image that Dean just put up behind me because those are the hoodies. Yes. The new beautifully embroidered uh, hoodies with the latest uh, iteration of the Fish in Canada brand, and they are doing extremely well. Uh, we have uh, three different species, as you can clearly tell by this image, um, but more coming 
very soon. We might even have the striped bass on there at some point because we want to. And you know what we'll do, Dean? We'll put the striper on there. We'll put striped bass uh, on there, and then we'll sell them for, for you know, help the striped bass survive uh, kind of a motif. That'd be a good one. Right? Yeah, I, I think I'd buy that one. I'd buy that one yeah. myself. Anyways, uh, that's all happening at the store, fishingcanada.com, the store, or you can go to store or shop uh, in uh, shop.fishingcanada.com. It'll get you there as well. All kinds of good things. Uh, participate, enjoy. While you're there, uh, can they also do the contest, uh, Dean, from there? Is this something? Not shop.fishingcanada.com. But, but, but dot com. F- yeah, at dot com they can. And we have, we, have a, we have a bunch going right now. Yeah, anytime you got anything uh, you want to kill some time is a good place to hang out. Mm-hmm. You might also want to go there to to see where you can ask questions uh, that we might answer for you here on the show, uh, such as did Stephen from Wisconsin, he, uh, he is part of the listener feedback for this episode. He went uh, somewhere online and asked a question. And here it is. Uh, he says, you guys should revisit the whole moon phases discussion. Now, we've what he's referring to, we did a couple of television episodes. Uh, I did a, uh, an article on .com about it. We have interviewed various scientists and doctors on it. So we... we we have dabbled with it quite a bit, and I personally love the subject because although I believe that it does affect fish, I'm talking the moon's phase, this, I think the salooner phase is even more important. That is the moon as it relates to the sun, as it relates to the earth, as opposed to just the moon's phase. But regardless, this is not my question. It's Stephen from Wisconsin asking this He's saying, you guys should revisit the whole moon phase of discussion, especially concerning walleye and muskie. He says, Dr. Cook's study about the moon affecting bass is silly to me. And for those of you who who aren't familiar with that, uh, we had Dr. Cook on here, of course, on Fish Talk with the Doc. And we talked about his studies and how the moon phase affected bass and he kind of poo-pooed it a little bit on us he kind of said yeah it's not really anything to concern yourself with but regardless uh steven says that bass will eat all day or steven cook said that bass will eat all day uh every day and are not affected by the moon now steven from wisconsin goes on to say there's a publication out of uh, escabada is that is that correct? That seems correct. Escabana, yeah, uh, Lake Fisheries Research Station in Wisconsin that proves that moon phase does in fact affect angler success with muskie and walleye, especially. He goes on to say, "I'd like to remain semi semi anonymous." Obviously, that ship has sailed, Steve, from Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just uh, think, it's a topic that deserves its merits properly represented. Is all. And we thank you for that because I agree with you 100%. I remember when uh, Dr. Cook came on and said, nah, it's not really a big deal. I didn't sleep that night. It was like telling me that there was no Santa Claus. So I agree. Moon does affect fish. I personally have witnessed it. Having said that, though, I will tell you this. I have never knowingly not gone on a fishing trip because it was not the perfect moon phase. So I... And as much as I believe in it, I don't build my fishing day around it. Yeah, it's always sure. like a bonus. Yeah. Like, like when you get there, you're like, oh, wait. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or the day after, yeah. say, hey, look at that. I was fishing on the perfect boot. But anyways. Yeah. anyways. Uh, podcast network highlights is something else we feature all over the place, especially on .fishingcanada.com. Uh, this week, we are highlighting Under the Canopy with Come our good now. friend, uh, Mr. Wallet previous minister of natural resources by the way jerry Willett, in case you were wondering uh episode 52 is being highlighted right now on account of it is the one year anniversary one year anniversary of mr Willett on our network and uh, he has a very special guest on that episode 52 it's, it's a bunch of bullshit it's not a bunch of bullshit dean it's moi it's moi for god's sakes 
Anyways, great episode. We had a lot of fun. Love uh, talking, Jerry, both on and off the mic. Fascinating gentleman and a wonderful product that you uh, don't want to miss a single episode of. So check it out. It's called Under the Canopy on the Outdoor Journal Radio Podcast Network, wherever you consume your podcasts. All right. Now, in the news, this is the big story. This is the biggie. In the news, um, Gulf of St. Lawrence striped bass quota tripled is the headline. And this took me by surprise. Our good friend Jeff Wilson from the East Coast uh, sent this to us because I wasn't aware of it before yep, it uh, We hit. were down at ICAST when he sent it to us. We were at ICAST. He was all pumped up about it. Yeah. By the way, you uh, all settled in from ICAST. You feeling better? I'm right? feeling great now, yeah. yeah. I still haven't recovered yet. I'm still no? a little. No. No. Uh, it was a great time, by the way. Great time down there. It was wonderful. We, were, we almost did a podcast from down there. Yeah, we nothing went right <laughs> the entire trip. Nothing went right. <laughs> Including somebody forgetting their passport at the rental, house rental, when we got to the airport. I won't mention that. Yeah, I don't names. know who that was. Mm-mm. But we survived it all. Anyways, uh, the big news, Gulf of St. Lawrence striped bass quota tripled. Now, on its own, on the surface, it might just sort of blend in with the background, another news story from, you know, a fishery uh, organization. But this one has a tremendous amount of impact because the the epicenter for this new regulation is going to take place on arguably the best striped bass river on the planet now, which is the Miramichi in New Brunswick. And um, the federal uh, fisheries minister, Diana Lebotier, uh, I hope I pronounced that correct. Is that you're you're you get you're linguistic? Uh, I'm linguistic. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, uh, Le Boutier uh, announced that she's more than tripling the size of the Southern Gulf of Saint Lawrence Indigenous Commercial Striped Bass Fishery. At the same time, increasing the catch limits for recreational anglers. Um, for retention of bass. So like it's all happening all at once. Like normally in these cases, little trickles here and there to try and figure out what works and what doesn't work. Fisheries management people are reluctant to make big changes unless it's to close down a fishery, like a moratorium. And even then, there's so much consultation that takes place leading up to those closures. It takes months, if not years. This came out of left field. Nobody was expecting this, especially the people on the Miramichi, the locals. This came completely out of left field. And when it's such a huge change, there's going to be question. And if you, if you were on uh, Facebook this past week, you know exactly what I mean. There has been so much on this on social media. Most of it negative. Because the question is, why are we increasing it almost by four? I can see maybe if there's a need to increase it, if there's a need. And by the way, are you aware of any need, Dean? When we're out there, you don't find it in restaurants. You don't. People don't even seem to eat it. They don't even eat fish down there. Yeah. They, well, they don't eat this fish. Yeah. So, so I don't so, know where the demand is. And, and, and as far as the commercial fishery, I don't think that's blame here either because when we're down there and we've been down there every single one of the four seasons we have been on that river and i gotta tell you there's only been one time that i saw those nets you know the the nets on the bank of the mirror machine there's only one time that i saw those nets even working you know yeah 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 they've been out of commission every time i've seen every time we go so so i don't get it and that's why we um we have this guest coming up here shortly that might shed a little bit of light on the situation because it doesn't make sense to me. Even from an angling standpoint, I don't think I heard one angler saying, yeah, well, you know, I wish I could keep four of these fish and eat them. Yeah. No, they just catch and release. They go there and have fun. Maybe they take one or two home. I don't know, even if that's even the case. But regardless, um, an additional quota of 125,000 fish is to be assigned to First Nations in the Southern Gulf on top of the quota of 50,000, which they already have. And like I just said, I haven't seen them taking that quota once yet. I haven't seen them out there fishing. So 
I, I don't know what this is all about, but now it's going to be raised. Um, it, uh, it leaves room for a lot of questioning. And one of the big questions is surrounding the Atlantic Salmon Federation, which apparently came out and praised DFO when this announcement was made. Yeah, they're all over social media too. Like there's actually a lot of support for it from that side. Well, yeah. 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 But they actually praised um, the DFO for, for doing this. Um, there's no scientific information that would lead anybody to believe that the striper bass is in any way connected to the demise of the Atlantic salmon. Totally untrue. But, but they become the salmon, the, the uh, striped bass has become the whipping boy for the Atlantic Salmon Federation. And so they've taken all kinds of steps and measures, not to mention all kinds of dollars have been spent in, uh, in the marketing ma machinery to uh, let people know that the striper bass, and to some extent the smallmouth bass too now, is being accused of um, the demise of the Atlantic salmon fishery. And once again, there's nothing to prove it. Personally, uh, we've spent enough time in the water, in that area, talking to folks to tell you that I don't think there is even a percentage point that can be attributed to the uh, striper bass for the Atlantic salmon demise. It's happening all over the world. There's something going on with the Atlantic salmon. It's not just freshwater, it's uh, saltwater, but even freshwater salmon. Anywhere where there's Atlantic salmon, there's controversy right now, globally speaking. In the, in the Scandinavian countries, they've got their own issues with Atlantic salmon. The problem is over-harvesting. We're just eating the crap out of them, and we just don't realize that it, it's... <laughs> It's fine. You know, it's fine when, when you've got a billion people on the planet and you're harvesting the oceans for Atlantic salmon and feeding those billion people Atlantic salmon. And, uh, that's, that's all well and good. But what we don't realize is that as that population grows and doubles and triples and quadruples and gets up to 7 billion people, that some resources are not self-sustaining. And I think the Atlantic salmon is one of them. It's, it's just the way it is. It's reality. And they seem particularly unable to survive like hot years and stuff like that, which we have more of. And they're just pretty sensitive. I think that's a big issue. Huge issue. Huge, huge issue. They do not, they're not adapting well to this new world that we live in, both in terms of more population with more need and you just mentioned climate. Anybody said climate? Holy mackerel. We all know that we've lost a, a degree or two in all of our northern waters. Well, guess where these fish spawn? In the cool, fresh it's up river where, where that cool water is. Well, if that water is a degree or two warmer every year, it just affects their ability to reproduce. You know? But anyways, regardless, the Atlantic Salmon Federation praises DFO for this newfound gift to the commercial fishery and apparently to the recreational anglers that want to kill four fish a day. It's a daily possession limit. That's the part that's scary. It's not even a total, it's not a possession limit. You're allowed four a day. So that to me reeks of somebody wanting to get rid of a fish. That's what to me this is. But what do I know? We'll, uh, we'll find out from the uh, people who are in the know here shortly on the program. Um, what else do I have? I think we'll cover most of the rest of the history and stuff later on. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we'll let the experts right. handle that. All right, let's go to, um, oh my goodness, there it is. Terry Merrick from Saskatchewan on Fan Question of the Week before we move along. Comes to us from Saskatchewan. Uh, by the way, submit your fan questions to info at Fishing Canada. A dot com on, or man. on Facebook, Instagram, any place. It doesn't really matter. I don't even know why they tell me to tell you that because I know for a fact that Dean will take questions on the back of a napkin. Yeah. And and it you know slide it under the front door. He'll read it anyway. You can get them. Uh, anyway, you can get them. So he's hard up for these things. So don't make it make him feel like you know you 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 must no. It doesn't matter. Just 
reach out to him. He'll take it. Uh, I don't know whether Terry put it on the back of a napkin from Saskatchewan, but uh, Terry nonetheless got drawn out of the famous 45-gallon drum that all of these requests go into. There's a bunch of bullshit. Oh, here we go again. With I'm going to start. I'm going to cut you off of that. Uh, Terry wants to know how much of an effort effect. If I could read properly, we'd get this right. How much of an effect do you think a snap swivel, a snap swivel, uh, has on walleye? I like using them to make changing baits easier, but do you think I am catching less fish because of them? So, great question, by the way, because uh, I think you're going to get a divided opinion on this. If Pete was here with me, he'd probably disagree with me because I catch him using snaps all the time. And I say, what the hell are you doing? But in my opinion... And I know, I know they make your changing baits easier, right? It's simple. Just snap, put a new bait on, and off you go. So if I go out fishing for the convenience of being able to switch baits quicker, I probably wouldn't go out fishing at all. Because there's a lot more things that are inconveniencing me when I go fishing than just changing my lure. If I got rid of all those things, I wouldn't be out fishing. So to me, changing your lure, tying a proper knot on each because different lures call for different knots. Tying the proper knot on, on each bait is, uh, is all part of the game to me. And any time that you, I even, I get paranoid about the profile of a knot, the size of a knot. That bothers me. It's, it's always looming big in my head. Am I affecting the action on this bait with it? So my answer is no, do not, do not use any metal components of any kind between your line and your bait. Now I know you muskie anglers are going to say, are you out of your mind? No, I'm not out of my mind. Because I was going to say, with the one exception, perhaps, if you're muskie fishing, then you do need some kind of metal between you and the fish because that fish will tear you apart. There's no question about it. Although, I just want to throw this out there. The world's biggest muskie was caught without a leader. Just want to throw it out there. It was caught on a little rapala lure. It was a, it was a incidental catch. They landed it in the whole bit with just monofilament line. So, I'm throwing it out there. Dean, what do you think of that? I don't trust them at all. I never use them. You never use them. Even when we were up, we were up on the Mackenzie and those fish, like the pike we were catching up there, they don't care about anything. No. But we had a snap open up and I don't think you'll ever have like a nod on like an 80 pound leader break. Well, the the argument there though is, uh, could they bite through an 80 pound leader? I don't know. Like I would trust... So the fish that I caught, which hopefully will be on the show next year, that was on just a knot that I tied. Perfect. And that was, you know, a 40-incher or yep. whatever it was. Yeah. So, you know, if that can hold, then I'll, I'd rather trust my knot over a manufactured snap because I've had yeah. those open up and break so many times, and it's just totally out of your hands. Now, good quality heavy-duty snaps do exist, right? Yeah, but these like what were we fishing up there? Yeah, I know that was wasn't that the Peter the yeah, Peter the, leader the, the Peter leader. They were like <laughs> like they were made for like sharks or something, and <laughs> well, they, they were <laughs> opening. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I don't trust good. them at all. That's a good point. Yeah, that's right too. Because I had one go on me too. So, yeah, but yeah. Uh, no. As a rule, uh, Terry from Saskatchewan. As a rule, I'm going to say ninety five, ninety six percent of the time that you see me. Uh, throwing baits out there they are tied directly onto my line without question and i and i highly suggest people listening unless you're an ardent musky angler and 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 you're using you know a bait that weighs three and a half pounds and costs 182 dollars unless you're doing that i don't think you need it you know it's going to affect especially smaller baits that's where it really, and that be, that just aggravates me when I see anglers using them on jigs. That's crazy to me, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, Terry, definitely, no, no. We interrupt 
developed this program to bring you the much anticipated bonus code for the latest Fishing Canada giveaways. This week's code is STRIPER. That's STRIPER. S-T-R-I-P-E-R, all uppercase. And don't forget, that's one P. Just type that in the bonus code section of the contest and receive 100 free entries towards all our current giveaways. For those who haven't entered yet, what the heck are you waiting for? Head on over to fishingcanada.com while you listen to the rest of this episode. Click contests and sign up for all the latest Fishing Canada giveaways. And now, back to the show. All right, as I said before, uh, this is uh, going to be a great interview. I've been looking forward to it ever since I heard that uh, Dr. Trevor Avery was going to be joining us on the program to talk about uh, a very, I think, um, moving forward, a very difficult issue that we're all going to have to deal with, both as, as anglers and as naturalists, cons- conservationists, uh, commercial fishermen, everybody involved. It's going to be a tough one. Uh, thank you for joining us, Doctor. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So, obviously, uh, let's take it right back from the beginning. Uh, it was um, about three weeks ago that we first heard about it about this new ruling that has been handed down by a DFO, uh, I would imagine. I know the Atlantic Salmon Federation has got fingerprints all over it and people are talking about them, but really this is a DFO thing. And uh, they basically said that they were going to increase the catches, catch limits on striped bass in the Miramichi to the point where, you know, and this happens all over the country, as you know, uh, doctor, I mean, uh, Creel census tell us that things change from time to time, and therefore, you know, uh, fish managers have to make changes as well. So it's not really a shock. I think the real shock is the quantities that they're changing. And in some cases, well, they've doubled the angler uh, quotas. So an angler that was keeping two stripers now has got the right to take four. And so that's double. And the uh, commercial fishing... Um, which is primarily the indigenous communities on uh, or community on the Miramichi. Uh, it's four times their normal quota. And I think that's probably the shocking part. You were pretty vocal on this uh, right from the get go. So I'm going to uh, open it up to you. First of all, uh, tell us what the impact will be and when we can expect to really feel the impact of this drastic move. Oh, those are big questions. Uh, just a couple of points off the top. It's uh, the recreational fishery went from three to four. Three so to it four. was three last okay. year. It's it's four now. Uh, so there's a slight increase there. Um, and the commercial 25, one. 25% increase. <laughs> yeah. And the commercial one is uh, has gone up not, not quite quadrupled because it's 175 from 50 uh, in total, how many, seventy-five thousand individuals. Well, then let me ask you this: if we're if we're uh, if we're looking at the details, how good of a handle do we have on the existing commercial fishery quota? Anyways, I mean, is this um, yeah. is this document? Is it in stone? Do we know for a fact that 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 number is real, or is it just maybe we kind of hope that that's what it was? There's. Uh, well, the, the current one, or the previous one, I guess now, right. was 50,000 50, individuals. Right. But there's uh, there's no, um, the only reports that we have uh, that I've been able to get, uh, and my colleagues, is, is that they, have, they haven't they have fished uh, that number yet. So that 50,000 hasn't been attained. Um, and uh, presumably because there's not uh, necessarily a, a, a viable buyer for the straight bass so you know what's yeah. the market um yeah. that sort of thing but but that's I, I don't have any confirmation on any of, of that um except that we don't know what the actual number is um in the uh, documents from from dfo uh, not the recent announcement but some of the papers leading up to this uh, publications leading up to this um where they've looked at the reference limits etc um in there it does state that that the, the actual number on the catch will be a, a privacy uh, issue. So, you know, the, we don't, we don't uh, know what that uh, reporting uh, is unless it's reported. A privacy issue. Can you, can you explain that for us? If you could, uh, that, I, I can't explain it. I just, that's what <laughs> that's it says. That's just what it is. <laughs> it says a, in the document that. A privacy know, you, issue. 
Yeah. Well, it, it's, you know, it's an agreement between two parties and, and, uh, you know, they've, they've got the, the quote up to 50,000, but uh, who they're reporting to on that is um, probably going to be DFO, but then it would be, it's not necessarily going to be public knowledge. I mean, there's lots of things that DFO gets uh, reported to them that's not public knowledge. You have to go through the proper channels to get that Really? I did not know that. I thought everything was out uh, in the open. It was transparent. If we, if I wanted to find out how many smallmouth bass are being harvested in uh, Lake X, I can some. If I'm willing to make the effort to dig, that this was all available to me. You're telling me that's not necessarily the case. No, it depends on what uh, information um, you're looking for. I mean, for example, the commercial lobster fishery. You can't get the information of a specific vessel of how much a specific vessel is catching you can get an aggregate information if you ah, apply gotcha to get the, the reported information so that's that's a standard okay. thing in dfo it's it's a protection measure and it's, it's you know i'm not disagreeing with it at all um if i haven't mentioned it already uh, dr avery is an expert uh, in uh, biology, mathematics, and statistics. So uh, when he talks about numbers, uh, I think he knows a thing or two. And you've been working on striped bass primarily for some time. Tell us a little bit about the background uh, with that. Uh, yeah, probably since about uh, 2004, 2005, I've been working on striped bass as one of my primary species of, of uh of uh, research areas uh, at, at Acadia University. And I'm in the biology department, but I recently I'm also cross-appointed to the math and stats department, primarily to teach statistics to undergraduates. And um, so I do have expertise in that area as well. So um, I've been working on striped bass, mainly from the recreational fisheries perspective. So how do we get citizen scientists, stewards, uh, in that are catching uh, striped bass to help us uh, with the fishery, help us inform numbers, catches, size of fish, all those sorts of metrics that are really difficult to get uh, from a broad scale fishery that's primarily a recreational fishery, yeah, uh, except for the, the small commercial fishery on the Miramichi. Mishi. Um, it's small in comparison to historical commercial fisheries. Um, is uh, uh, difficult to get the the rest of the information, and so I've spent you know nearly twenty years trying to figure out approaches to getting those sorts of pieces of information, and I've tried all sorts of different things to to get it. You say that the uh, commercial fishery is small in comparison to the recreational fishery on the river. No, I d I don't oh. know that. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I don't think anybody knows that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of fish caught in the recreational fishery. It's about right. it's about retention and right. um, as well this because retention is mortality, right. uh, but it's also about fisheries related mortality mortality that we uh, we, we can't estimate uh, easily. Which is you know what happens to the catch and release fishery. Um, there are, there is mortality associated with catch and release, um, whether that's you know foul hooked uh, fish or fish that swallow a hook or uh, get tangled in line. There's all sorts of things that can happen to to cause mortalities in catch and release fishery. So it's it's not it's not a zero mortality picture. No, for we don't sure. know what that number is. Um, we do, and we don't know what the number of retention uh, the retention fishery is as either. Do we have a handle on the number of people fishing for this species recreationally? Do we do we know that you know annually there's a um, hundred thousand people on the river? How, is there a number that you go by at all? There is no known number. No known number. Uh, because it's a coastal fishery, it doesn't require a license. Right. Um, and I'm so, sorry. By the uh, way, I'm sorry to, to laugh at that. I, I apologize. <laughs> but but it's to me, it seems kind of absurd, to be honest with you, that, you know, we have such a spectacular fishery on the Miramichi yeah. for bass that we don't have a handle on the numbers. If it was mine, if I owned that fishery, man, I would know everything about that everything yeah so but, there's a bit of a backstory to that it's uh it's not something that that um uh, hasn't been thought of before i mean it's it's uh it is uh um, trying to figure out how many coastal saltwater anglers there are in right. maritimes has has been proposed a number of times 
um, some time ago, and I can't remember the, the dates, so let's say pre-COVID by quite a bit, um, there was a, a, an attempt to try and get a saltwater uh, license. Uh, part of the issue there is that saltwater anglers um, don't want to pay for a license. Um, and then it was proposed that maybe we make that license free just so we could track the number of people. It's, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do to track people that are fishing in uh, coastal fisheries, regardless of what it is, striped yeah. bass, mackerel, smell. You don't know how many people are doing it. And on top of that, you don't know how, uh, how uh, successful they are at right. catching things, and you don't know what that fishing effort is. So one person saying, I have a license, and oh, okay, that's a, that's a one. We have one person has a license, and they go out once a year. What's their impact on the fishery? Well, it could be zero. They might not catch anything. Um, but if you have 100,000, as you suggested, out on the fishery uh, every year and everybody's catching 100 fish, and 10% of those, even with catch and release, are uh, d- dying because you know, they had to get foul hooked or something, um, uh, there's consequences to catch and release, is my point. And, um, you know, that, that number adds up, right? Oh, for sure. Without question. And, you know, we we talk about it on this show quite a bit. The value of having licenses and having to be licensed to fish in various jurisdictions to to experience this wonderful thing we have in this country called fishing. The value is really um, on the, all that information you just said is being lost without having a license. Because if you don't have licensed yeah. anglers, how do we garner, how can we you know, get all that valuable information to manage the fishery properly. And that's, that's going to be an issue with stripers, I think, on that river until the license issue gets resolved. I know people don't want to hear that, but it's, it's necessary. Whether it's free or whether there's a small fee associated with it, it's kind of irrelevant. But we need to know who's doing what to who to have a handle. Because um, you said some pretty alarming things uh, after this this news story broke and that was that you believe that based on current information uh, we could totally decimate that fishery within three years if we going keep going in this direction so all the more reason why we need the information we need the data people like you have to have a shelf full of numbers that you can push around so that you can help us maintain it and and use it properly right how yeah, serious? Uh, how serious are you about that comment? It's uh, it's a little bit out of context, um, as you know. We had a forty minute interview with with CBC, and they take half a dozen Clips. Um, yep. quotes quotes yep. from you. Um, I'm used to that. I've done this a lot. Um, it's nothing to get upset about. Um, but the, the there's a few qualifications on this. This 175,000 is the number that uh, minister is allowing in the commercial fishery. If you take 175,000 of your uh, spawning stock on that river, that's presumably where the catch is going to happen during the, during the spawn or just after the spawn um, on that river system, because that's when you get the high aggregation of striped bass in the area. Um, Then, and right now, we know that the number of spawners, the estimate of the number of spawners from 2022 is about 450,000 fish, let's say. Um, the numbers are all published in um, DFO reports. There will be an estimate for 2023, which I'm eagerly awaiting, uh, because that estimate, if it, if it continues to go down from the, the high that we saw a couple of years ago, where there was around 950,000 spawners on the river, then the trajectory for the population is already trending uh, downwards. So, so it's not necessarily stable, but that's, that's the nature of fisheries. That's a separate thing. And we can talk about that if you'd like, but that's a separate thing. But if you take too many uh, spawners out of the system uh, for successive years, then you end up not having spawners there to replenish the um, juveniles that, you know, they spawn eggs and, and replenish the juveniles, and that's called recruitment. So you have to be able to recruit new spawners to the fishery. So those would be fish that are three, four, or five years old. Um, there's various estimates on when 
females and males become mature, but you're going to need enough females, enough males uh, of the right age. And the, uh, that, that recruitment picture, if you take out too many of your spawning spawners in a short period, then you're going to probably, um, highly likely, uh, reduce those re- that recruitment. The, the problem is you're not going to see the problem for some years because right. it's going to take uh, three years uh, at a minimum to see a fish recruit to the fishery that can spawn. Uh, and then uh, there are uh, other fish out in the fishery as well um, that are of larger size that are older. And these striped bass can live up to, let's say, 30 years. Some estimates is 35 and maybe on average it's more like 20. Well, we don't necessarily know that um there's some information or data that we can pull on that but let's say it's let's say it's 30 years be optimistic uh so they're going to be some long-lived fish uh spawning in that fishery and maybe they're going to prop everything up and that's great uh the one big thing going for the near machine is they have a slot limit fishery for at least for the recreational fishery and i'm not sure exactly what it would be for the commercial fishery um but if you if you put but take a lot of those spawners out of the system quickly, and there's only 450,000 every year, you have to be replacing that 175,000 you're taking out of the system. And you have to be pretty certain you're, that that's happening. And I'm not cert- sure the certainty is there that you'd be replacing this every year. And that's sort of the problem that I have with it. So, And, and you won't see that effect for some time. It's so, just the other other side of it. A couple of things come to mind. First of all, what I have been led to believe for a number of years uh, from other jurisdictions that have similar problems is that when quotas are, are etched in stone, the reality of the matter is that the people pushing those numbers around and coming up with, with those quotas have got a preconceived notion as to how successful the harvest is actually going to be. What I mean by that is if a quota is uh, 100,000 pieces, they're actually, in their mind, you know, 60,000 is going to actually be fulfilled. And there, I guess there's a there's a, a bit of wiggle room for them. Now, in this mm-hmm. fishery, uh, they can't even be thinking that because we have never had, to my knowledge anyways, you could probably straighten me out on that there's never been um first of, first of all the fish is depending on who you talk to is either brand new or it's been there for a thousand years i mean you could talk to folks and they call it invasive i know it's not because i've talked to people locals who have been fishing them since they were kids and that would make that fish at least 80 years old so there's some 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 discussion that you know, is merited with that, but let's forget that for a moment. So if they're saying 175 and they are, they are aware of the fact because they gave us the numbers that there's only 450 coming into the system. I'm talking 450,000. If there's 150,000, 175 that is allowed uh, by the commercial fishery and we don't know what the number is for recreational anglers, because we don't know how many recreational anglers we have on the system at any given time, but we do know now that they can take four home. Right. They're, I mean, this is beyond Russian roulette. This is beyond insanity because I'm just putting down the numbers. They're saying that they can dispose of about 50% of their current breeding stock and still have this fish survive according to what DFO is saying. Yeah. And that's, Half. That's not a. That's not a uh, out of the realm of possibility position. Let's let's be clear on that. The, their what do you mean? modeling that they've done has been is very is very good. Uh, it's the best model they can do um, on given the information that they have. But the, the problem is that they don't have all the information. So there are some assumptions in that model, and what the model tells us is that you can take so many fish out of the system and as long as there's a recruitment coming and which the model also predicts the recruitment's going to be great that this is the number that you can take out um, and 
I, I don't know if it's the 175. That's not how the model works. It's basically if you have, uh, uh, if, if you see the estimates of how much your abundance is between that lower and upper reference limit, then whatever your quote is, is essentially working or not working. You have to wait to see what, what that number does to the population. After, after the fact. Not, not based on the math. Yeah, after the fact. But that's how probably 90% of the fisheries are managed. They're managed in a, in a, by a, a retention, right? The landings. So whatever the landings are in a fishery, you put that as the next data point, and then you adjust uh, and with, with some predictive capability, but not, not very accurately, what the next year uh, landing should be. So conceivably, you could adjust this number every year, and uh, as long as there's a nice, accurate assessment of how many fish are in the, how many spawners are in the system, which is what they measure right now, uh, that number has some uncertainty to it, and the uncertainty is not small. So 175,000, in my opinion, if you attain that, coupled with the not knowing how many recreational anglers are out there right. and not knowing how much retention is going on, or, and as well, not knowing... Um, what our catch and release mortality is, right? Um, that that what is that number at the end of the day? Is it two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand? We don't know. Like it's 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 hard to to say. It's going to so, be it's going to be almost fifty percent of what you predict. What you think you've got an inventory by the sounds of it. That's what they're this experiment you're, is you're, gambling you're, with, right? Yeah, you're you're banking that the recruitment picture is going to work, right? Um, and that's and that's somewhat variable you've got um and this let's contrast this with the st john river it's just pretty good evidence in the st john river that there was one good spawn in the last 15 years or so where where there was a good spawn that had lots of young juvenile fish coming to the fishery and there and it's highly episodic in other words it doesn't occur every year where you have a very good spawn Lots of eggs surviving, lots of juveniles surviving, and good recruitment into your into your ages one, two, three. What uh, fish to become spawners? What would uh, attribute to the the recruitment levels being high or, or low? Like, it's all to do with uh, the complexities of the system. And so, the food the food that's in the river itself, where where the juveniles are feeding, the egg survivals by depending on temperature and salinity and and uh, whether there's other predators eating the eggs. Uh, so there's, right. you know, and those are just a few factors. So there's lots of factors that play into that survival picture. Um, we don't, I don't think we have a very good uh, handle on uh, how that works uh, through uh, the, the striped bass uh, or for lots of other fish. Um, so that population dynamics, and that's the big the big word, the population dynamics, is how all that fits together, is, a, is a, an uncertain science. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong, and I'm not saying that their estimates aren't, uh, they're as good as they can be, but the estimate of 450,000 in the system could be a lot higher, but it also could be a lot lower. That's, uh, so that, that's, that's the picture. That's the, the whole, this thing blows my mind because we don't have those numbers uh, those accurate numbers that we can rely on when you throw such a big number in terms of retention at 175,000 plus whatever that other number is for wreck fishing. I mean, that's why I'm looking at 50%. If, if we are going to say that, that, that the number is close to being accurate, that's 50% of the inventory is coming off the shelf legally. That's legally by the way, because we're not counting on the illegal catches. And we all know that that happens on any body of water where you've got game fish or at least table fare fish like the striped bass. Uh, it behooves me, but I want to just, before I forget, I want to go back to something we touched on a little bit earlier on. And that is the claim sure. that this fish is an invasive species because I want, mm. I think it's important here that we, we communicate that message because I can't help but feel, and you don't have to agree with me, that this, the motivating factor here to make this drastic change was in part due to the Atlantic salmon and its decline and the Atlantic Salmon Federation uh, Association. 
they want to keep that fish. They want to, they want to hopefully bring it back. I don't know what they want to do, but they're trying everything in order to try and uh, save that fish at the cost of this fish. And if this fish is in fact invasive, they may have a good point. But if it's not, which I don't think it is, based on my own information, then you're... You're, you're kind of picking sides, aren't you? On this, you're saying, "Well, yeah, I'm, I'm into Atlantic salmon fishing, and I, and, and I'm not into bass fishing. So let's kill that one at at the behest of my." Well, that doesn't work in today's society, does it? You know, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> a lot. There's a lot. First of all, is it invasive or is it not? Can we have a definitive answer on that? Uh, as in. Uh, well, that depends on your definition of invasive. Um, it, invasive, if you're saying is it an alien, inv alien invasive species, the answer is no. It's always been here. An right. alien invasive species is one that has uh, uh, come from somewhere else where it's, right. uh, where it's native. Right. Um, in this case, since the last glacial ice age, uh, salmon, striped bass, and, and lots of other uh, brook trout and, and lots of other things uh, became naturalized if you want to put it that way and sure. we consider those to be native fish species sure. so striped bass have always been there if you look at the historical um records of striped bass they're uh, up and down the american seaboard but specifically in the maritimes there are lots of numbers there of, of commercial catches of striped bass when there was commercial fishery um this has been documented in a few different publications uh sam andrews uh, has published some of this and it's published by DFO themselves. The historical catches are, um, the, the numbers are out there um, for the commercial fisheries. So they've been around. Uh, they went through uh, decades where there was super low numbers and fisheries were cut off. This isn't the first time that the fisheries has been uh, cut off um, or changed. Um, and I'm speaking that striped bass fishery previously was cut off recreational and everything right. to try and build that stock back up again, which was quite successful, obviously. Um, and so when was that, that when, when was that uh, Trevor, when, do you, when, when, when you, did they stop the fishery? Right. Oh, I can't remember the exact year, but uh, it was back when they had uh, around 5,000, yes, it was around 5,000 spawners in the, in the population. So, and that went on for about five years and right. that, um, was, um, you know, they, and that, and they stopped the fishery and then over the next, uh, five, 10, it's usually quoted as 20 years. So the recovery happened over 20 years. Right. Um, and that's a long time to, to see something recover to the point where you can say, Oh, well, let's put, um, a fishery back on, but it took about five, five, six, seven years after that, that. 5,000 spawners to get the fishery back on. So is it invasive in that context? In that context, the, uh, the word invasive sometimes is used in invasive uh, uh, fish uh, and other species biology is to mean uh, a rapid influx of something, a rapid increase in some things so that they become, um, that they might have some range expansion. Uh, and we're seeing that with striped bass. They're, they're up in Labrador. They went up there in 2017 and they're still there. Um, so there wow. is some range expansion happened. That happened right around the same time when that, uh, the estimate of the spawning, the spawning uh, stock on the uh, mirror she was estimated around 950,000 fish. Um, since that time, things have, have come down, but the, the, uh, the spawning stock estimate that is, and uh, but the fish stayed up in Labrador. So there's a range expansion there. So are they considered invasive up in Labrador? Well, there's no living memory and there's no historical memory from the Inuit up there of ever having striped bass in that system. So so that's a that's more like an alien invasive species than just a population increase that might be termed invasive. So the terminology is sometimes a little. A it, little goofy. You can use it to your advantage or disadvantage, uh, depending on how you. Um, do on we, how you want to sensationalize yeah, your message? Exactly. Do we have a handle on what happened uh, to to drop the population by fifty percent from nine fifty to to four fifty? Do we know what 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 caused it? No, that's it. It's wow. uh, this. This is the uncertainty. 
that I'm talking about in population dynamics. So if it, if it was 950, was that an anomaly? Was that year an anomaly? Was that year a calculation error? They just happened to catch more of their, uh, this estimate is done by tagging uh, with um, uh, little streamer tags, essentially. So visible tags in Stripe Bass. So every year GFO goes out to tag a bunch. Um, I don't know how many, but quite a few. And then they look in some herring weirs and they monitor those for the returnees. And and the important thing is the ones that aren't tagged. So you need to have that ratio of the tagged and the untagged in the herring right. weirs. And then you use those values um, to uh, make that estimate. That that methodology they use um, what is, uh, was developed some time ago. It's, a, again, another very good model for what, how you would go about this complicated. Um, and uh, it comes with some uncertainty, uh, quite a bit of uncertainty, but that's a common right. thing again in fisheries. So it's hard to, I, it, I, it's the uncertainty that's the problem here. It's not, if everything was super accurate, we'd be able right. to say every year there's this many fish in the system. You could take this many and we know that next year there's going to be this many more coming in. Yeah. The problem is, is the, is the numbers, um, the, the uncertainty of that. On average, over all of those years of producing these um, different models, and the models I'm talking about now are the ones for the recruitment to the fishery that are uh, sort of predicting these upper and lower reference limits, uh, those models uh, also have uncertainty in them. And if they don't, the numbers at the end of the day, the predictive numbers past what we currently know, uh, tend to be a tend to look a little bit high if you look at some of the diagrams that they have for this. So you have to you have to bring that all into context again and you have to look at the fluctuations because populations naturally fluctuate and striped bass populations are no different. They go up, they come down, they go up, they come down. If you did nothing else to them, we as humans are now imparting something on those populations. And so the effect of that is going to make that population go up or down probably even quicker than what it naturally does. I can so tell this you is, this is where my concern comes in. On a personal level, I've been fishing uh, the Miramichi and bass in particular for the better part of eight years now. It's pre pandemic. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, I have seen the number drop. I don't know whether it dropped from 900 to 400,000, ah. but I can tell you from personal experience that um, the number has definitely been dropping on that river. Uh, still, that's, still spectacular. That's, uh, but, yeah. But, 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 and that's the crux of what my research is all about that I, that I've been working on for years is, is trying to figure out is you hear a lot from recreational anglers. You hear a lot for, uh, from professional anglers. You hear a lot from professional fishers, commercial fishers, uh, um, not necessarily in striped bass, but in other yep. commercial fisheries. Mm -hmm. And we need to listen to them. We need to listen to what people are saying. There's um, the traditional ecological knowledge that's out there is, uh, you know, unparalleled. We, we have to listen to that. We have to figure out a way to integrate that into our knowledge of the system. And when you have uh, many, many recreational anglers posting and saying, oh, I you know, last year it was great. This year I already caught anything. Uh, does that have merit? And mm -hmm. it's, it's not because they're using a different fishing rod or different bait or fishing in a different spot. It, it may just be that there are fewer fish around. So you have to have, keep that open as a possibility. Um, and it's probably not, you know, an improbable possibility. So, so I get you. I hear that um, from lots of recreational anglers that are out there, you know, it's been really good. It's been really bad. Um, and right now the, the, the word on the street is it's less than it was. So you well, have to put some merit in it. when you couple that with a good solid science, then, then you have to believe that, 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 that number is to be true. And which, which brings me to my next question or, or maybe statement. Um, there's all kinds of buzz on social media about this. The minute that it broke, yeah. people were spewing all kinds of things, including the fact that uh, DFO was totally ignoring science and just appeasing some special user groups. 
uh, and, and giving away the farm, so to speak, but ignoring science. Do you believe that 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 could be the case here? Has science been used in this in this tabulation of 175,000 will be the, the, the new benchmark that we can take out of the system and it sustains itself? There's, a, again, a little bit fun back there. Um, I wouldn't say they've ignored DFO uh, in this sense. The DFO has a lower reference limit and an upper, upper reference limit for the number of spawners in the system. Uh, but that depends on which of the underlying models we try to take back. Um, and there's, there's, there's two models that sort of make the most sense. Uh, that whole framework of how that was done was reviewed by many scientists other than the ones that developed it at DFO, and they did a fantastic job, and I was uh, one of the, uh, one of many reviewers. And, and um, uh, you know, that's a very good model. The, the lower and upper reference limits, the lower reference limits around 200,000 um, spawners in the system. Um, you, you have to be able to monitor that and what they're doing so they know how many spawners are in the system every year. Um, so, and the model also says that this is on average how things sort of work. This is how many eggs are in the system. This is, uh, this is how many recruiters are coming to the system. All of those models are pretty standard fisheries models that have been around for, uh, you know, many, many years. Um, some of them are new iterations of an old theme, but they're, they're pretty standard uh, in the way this, these things are calculated. Um, they still don't account for all the stochasticity, all of the variability in the system. Um, and so it's all these models are an on average model. On average, every year, this is on average, this, this is uh, what, what, we could, what we can expect. But it's the uncertainty that's the, that's the problem here, is that all these models have a lot of uncertainty. So all you can do is try this, and if the next year you see a uh, uh, precipitous decline in the number of spawners, you need to make adjustments. If it's two years later you see a precipitous decline, you need to make adjustments. And then that's how you keep things with between the lower and the upper reference limit. And I, I, I just think the number is a little high uh, for if you attain it, if you take out 175 and, you know, the, and the estimates for for how many are in the, in the spawning stock is a little bit delayed. We're still waiting for the 2023 estimate to come out, and it's we're into almost into August of 2024. So, and that's, so that's, what, uh, that's where what you're saying kind of concerns me, though, because in a perfect world, if we had a really good handle on our inventory and we knew exactly what was sitting on the shelf, we knew exactly what the stock looked like, I would agree with you. We can make a quick adjustment, and we can say, hey, that's, that obviously was a little too much. Look at, we've got, we can see right now yeah. that, that we have no size 10s left on the shelf. Therefore, we need, but you guys, like there is no, by the sounds of it, there is, we have no, it's all by guess by golly in terms of what are the actual well, numbers, right? I mean, we don't know. If if you're, if yeah. not you, and I'm not, not, not blaming you, but if DFO is off by, I don't know, 10% on their estimates, that thing will come, th this will come collapsing before your three-year prediction, I'm telling you. You can't take that big of a biomass out of any fishery. I don't care where it is. It could be Lake Erie Walleye. You, that's a big number that we're jumping to on yeah, that, an inventory level that we're not really we're not really sure what we got. It just that's and that's part of the part of the problem. I mean, that, in essence, that's that encapsulates the problem. If you don't have a very good, uh, uh, accurate estimate of what's there, right. and, and and I'm not saying that their estimate on average, their median estimate, their mean estimate is not a good one it probably is pretty realistic the problem is is that it also has high uncertainty associated with it and so if it's on the low uncertainty side um then you could be having uh, you know severe severity to beat that fishery in, in one go uh, one year two years um and if you couple that with the uncertainty in the recruiting picture say you had a high temperature year you didn't have good egg survival 
um, you're not going to see that in the fishery for three or four years. And so my caution here is that even though there's a cautionary approach being applied, that I think you need to be very vigilant about making sure we, we look at this fishery and doing our part as uh, recreational anglers and scientists to, to say, keep your eye on it because this is it's going to be critical to monitor this over the next few years. And part of the problem is there's, there's really not a lot of um, uh, funding to be able to do that. Uh, DFO has limited capacity to do what they do. Um, there's not a lot of funding coming to strike bass research to be able to answer some of these fundamental questions. And I'll give you an example. Um, the estimate for the fecundity, the number of eggs that are in a, a striped bass of a certain size uh, on the Miramichi River and in other places in the Maritimes is, is not known with uh, much accuracy. Some of the estimates of fecundity are taken from uh, old publications, uh, older data. Wow. Um, in the same system, some of it's taken from U.S. populations, which behave very differently from Canadian populations in some respects. And so that's a fundamental piece of the puzzle because all of those models are based on how many eggs are in the systems. So if the egg estimate is off, the trickle down from that is that you're going to get a recruitment picture that's off. That part of that with, with, with the numbers that are produced from, from the, the models that are there for that they're basing them off of is that I, I reviewed them before this and I, and I can't see anywhere where they, where they have this, the, the estimates for the spawning stock being sort of on par with what we're actually seeing. The estimates seem to always be much higher. And so I think they're being a little bit optimistic about what's happening with the population. And part of that is that model is based off of real data and that real data uh, from the uh, the estimates that they were getting, like they're not having 50 million or 90,000 down to the 450 or whatever it is now, is um, that produced a big spike in that in that um, that graphic, and uh, essentially that's going to influence the model to a certain extent. So that's how model works. That's it tries works. to take into consideration all of the values, right? So you can't just ignore one. So there's a little bit of lack of uh, what's called a a sensitivity analysis on that model to say what would happen if and yep. that's a way of looking at a complex model and saying what would happen if this happened for five years or that happened for five years and I'm not seeing uh, any evidence uh, of that being part of the picture here to make to make the estimate of the 175,000 so, for the commercial fishery and that might be what happened in the background but I have no knowledge of whether it did or not so, uh, from my perspective, once again, first of all, this is unprecedented. I, I don't think I've ever heard of a fishery going up in terms of uh, retention numbers like this ever in my lifetime. It's always the opposite. Uh, We've heard the cod fishery. The cod, the cod fishery, but 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 cod fishery went the other way, right? It it oh, it went uh, up retention. first. The retention, uh, the limits for how much you could catch, right. and the uh, was uh, not regulated uh, right. probably well enough. Right. Uh, so the parallel is, if you look at the cod fishery, it's a classic example of overfishing your spawning stock biomass. Yeah. Um, for two years in a row, the cod fishery, from all estimates of the spawning stock biomass that was there in the fishery, over two years, they took two-thirds or better of that out of the system and after two years the whole thing collapsed Collapse. well well there's a perfect example and it's not too far from home is it i mean that's that's what and no. it's not that old we should be able to look at that and learn something from it but i, I was going to say i've never heard of it going up before it's always being taken away as anglers we're always complaining that you know the government's taking away our fishing rights right but my question on this one is the fact that it's the opposite. There's no cost to anybody for these this increased harvest. There's no, from what I can understand from this, there's no economic benefit to the region, to the province, to the federal government, to anybody from this increased harvest. 
So if I'm on the outside looking in, if I'm just a a casual podcast listener that just fell onto this episode by accident, they got to be saying to themselves, well, what the hell is going on? If there's no economic benefit to anybody for doing this, why are we, there's no, this is not a case of trying to curb the growth of this species. Then why are we doing it? The question is, why are we doing it? Do, does anybody have a handle yeah, on exactly what's going on? Why is this happening to us, to everybody? I think there's a lot of things that happen at the top levels of, of government in the minister's office, uh, definitely, where there's more than one. Uh, well, what's the motivating, the what's the motivating factor? What so, is, it, is, it, is it the commercial fishery? Is it the recreational fishery? What's the motivating factor that would cause such a, a drastic change from the norm? in your opinion? Uh, I have no opinion on it. That's, that, it wanders too far into politics and, uh, and motivations uh, for me. I'm a, I'm a scientist. I just look at the numbers. I look at what's going on. I try to make uh, rational, independent uh, views of things that are out there. I, I do research with all different groups. I work on salmon too. Sure. Um, I work on striped bass. I work on uh, lots of different things to try and figure out, you know, how, how do we make things better? How can we listen to people? How can we integrate knowledge uh, from all different groups uh, together? Um, how can we improve uh, fish passage? How can we conserve the species that we have here uh, so that for generations to come, uh, that people can go out and catch a striped bass or some other fish that's out there and know that it's something that's good to eat um, and not full of contaminants or something like that. Um, By the way, it is my motivation. It's exceptional. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you've had striped bass, but it's exceptional table fare. And that's one of the problems. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that's one of the problems that it has. It's the same with walleye. One of the reasons that walleye is always on the verge, right? Always on because it's such great yeah. table fare right. that people just want to consume it. And I, and I think the striped bass fits right into that same problem area. So, um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good fish to eat. And, oh, uh, fantastic. you know, why, why not, uh, have it there so that people can go out and catch one and, and eat it. How many, how many fisheries are left that we have where you can go out and catch uh, a meal on it? I mean, you've got, uh, maybe brook trout, but, there's a lot yeah. of stocking of brook trout, right? You know, exactly. Exactly. they stock it, you, you catch it the next year, they stock it again, you catch it again. Yeah. Um, this is a natural population that's out there. It's, it might be, it, you know, the numbers have increased. Um, you know, obviously they've increased. There's more angles because the numbers have increased. If, you know, there's some simple metrics you can look at. And uh, because those numbers have increased, there's more people that are interested in going fishing them. And then that's going to bring uh, a swell of, of uh, retentions and so you're you know, we're, we're there's 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 things that go up and down in the fishery we do the yeah. fish but also the pressures that are on the fishery I, I, and those I, need to all be considered i know you can't take sides and i'm not asking you to take sides but and i, I don't want to take sides but um from my own once again personal experience <laughs> in that area of fishing i know that the demand, if there was a demand for this species uh, in terms of commercial value, which I think there should be, and this might cause that to happen, maybe, I don't know, but right now there isn't. Right now, the commercial fishery down there for striped bass is, is marginal at best. It's just there's no great demand. You know, you can't even get a, a feed of striped bass anywhere on the river. You can't go to a local restaurant or, or a place and get, they, they don't even serve it. So there's no real appetite, no pun intended for it, on the river itself. I'm thinking maybe this is designed to create a market for it. Maybe. Um, maybe. But, I, but I don't think it is. Personally, I don't think that's the case. I don't think this is... This is um, a commercial fishery issue. I think that's kind of a, a, an aside benefit of this new way of thinking about striped bass. So I'm, in my world, I'm taking that off the table. That's not the problem. I have to bring in the salmon, uh, Atlantic Salmon Federation into this because they've got their fingerprints all over it. Um, 
And the reason I want to bring it up just before we end this show is I want to put you on the spot a little bit as a scientist. Do you have any scientific proof that I can take home that says the striped bass on the Miramichi has caused the decline of the Atlantic salmon? As a scientist, do you have anything you can give me? It's, it's a loaded question. No. And it's, it's an incomplete question. <laughs> okay. Because you're asking, does it have an effect? And, and I could say striped bass eat salmon. They eat lots of other things too. Right. It's whether they have an effect on the population dynamics right. of Atlantic salmon. Are they the ones that, are they, the, is that the striped bass, the lever that was pulled in, this, in the Atlantic salmon world? where it caused the land of salmon to decline precipitously. And the evidence for that, and the answer to that question is it can't be. There are many, many rivers that have arguably zero impact from striped bass that are also declining with the land of salmon. So what is, the, what is the argument? What's the picture there? I think there's a lot there to thread together, and I don't think that you can say hitting one species against another no. is an answer because we can't hit one species against another to say that that's the problem. Okay. So I think what you're saying to me is that we have no scientific proof that on the mirror machine, the Atlantic salmon owes the striped bass. It's, it's, it, because that's what's going on here, right? You know, or may not know, but that's what the word is out there, that, that the reason that the Atlantic salmon fishery and, right. and populations are, are at an all-time low is because the striped bass has, has moved in, the invasive species has moved in and started mucking around with, with the salmon. And I know that's not the case, but I can't help but feel that that's what's happening here, and that's what we are witnessing here today um, with this, what I think is an insane increase in uh in harvest numbers for this wonderful species and it's to me it's atlantic salmon striped bass it's just another fish and it allows us people like me to go out and enjoy and recreate out there we have a reason to go out to the miramichi and and wet a line because of these fish i see no difference between the two i don't distinguish a difference it's a fish but i can't help but feel that this is what is going on here and I hope that the demise of the Atlantic salmon on that river doesn't cause the demise of the striped bass on that river. Because once they're both gone, then you got nothing left, and that would be a pretty well. Uh, there'd be something else. Some, somebody old something will move in. You're right. You're <laughs> so have, right. You'll have a lot more eel life. Yeah, that's uh, right. So, there you go. <laughs> you know. So it's it. This, these are complex systems, yes. and it's it's very difficult to. Uh, there's no smoking gun. I know. I know. What and okay. um, you know, there's what some evidence on one side. There's some other evidence on the other side that's way to greater complex of all the rivers and the maritimes. There's all kinds of stuff that come to play here. Um, it, the, the the problem here is that you have very few known documented and studied rivers of striped bass that have spawning populations. If right. there were another 20 rivers of striped bass yeah. that, that were spawning and being very productive and having lots of recruitment, then your argument of, you know, uh, looking at one river and doing something on it might hold a lot more water. Yeah. But we don't know that the striped bass does suspected other spawning areas, but we don't know what their contribution is to the population. We do know that the near machine river contributes to a massive uh, 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 number of striped uh, bass in the entire region, yeah. uh, right from Quebec all the way uh, around. So, um, so we do know that that's um, uh, something that is important to that to the whole population of striped bass. And if you're going to take one spawning river of striped bass and say, "Well, we need to wipe them out there uh, to, to save." Uh, the land of salmon. I just think that that's not a very, very good no. conservative approach to fisheries management. Not at all. I do know. I just thought of a species that will benefit. Probably is sitting back right now, just rubbing its hands, saying, "Yes, it's fins." Pardon me, smallmouth bass. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll take over. <laughs> no, arguably they've already taken over. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> There's lots of small old fast too. That's another oh. another interesting story. Jane Birkle's another interesting story. They're, yeah. they're they're all they all have impacts on things. Um, it's it's whether uh, the coexistence of all these things is is effective. Uh, to a high level and it's there's there's so many different ways of looking at this problem uh that's the, the fascinating part uh, we have to educate people and uh, to look at the big picture we have to think of things and uh knowledge in many different ways uh your local anywhere to to uh, uh all the way up to uh, the minister i mean it all counts. Well, one thing for sure, it's got everybody's attention, which some folks might say sure is a does. good thing, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Trevor, thank you so much for joining us. I've taken way too much of your time. We appreciate it and hope no to, uh, hope to, uh, as this thing unfolds and progresses, it's going to take a lot of different shapes and forms, I'm sure. I uh, would love the opportunity to hook up with you again and see where it is at that point. Anytime. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Trevor Avery, uh, professor at Acadia University. Uh, Biology, mathematics, and statistics are things that he is working on with regards to striped bass. And uh, I got to tell you, um, it's turning into a mess because we have the other side of this coin, of course, is uh, the, the tournament anglers. There's there's a, a, an incredible um, group of folks who work really hard at having tournaments on the mirror machine for striped bass. Our good friend Jeff Wilson being uh, the leader of that group, um, and the, they they're up in arms over it. And I and I can hardly blame them. This is going to be devastation for uh, for play people like that. But anyways, uh, interesting story. If you want to read up more, we will have it on fishingcanada.com as it unfolds. We broke the story um, on it uh, just recently, but I think it's just a start. There's going to be uh, a lot of backlash, I'm sure, in the days and weeks to come. Things may even change. Before it comes to fruition, it might get overruled. Who knows? Uh, Anyways, uh, thank you for joining us. That's the end of the show. And uh, we will be back next week with a bright new fresh episode. Hopefully my co-host will be back. He's out. God knows where I'll find out. Uh, Thanks for joining us on behalf of the entire team. Volvo behind the camera. Nick, as per usual. Dean Taylor, our producer. I'm Angelo Biola. Thanks for joining us, folks. Catch you next time.